want to talk to you a bit about financial innovation, a subject that's very, very close to my heart and something that has been fun because business has to be fun. If there's not any fun, it's not, worth, it's not actually worth doing. And also to pose a question to you, really, and that's how much of actually what we do is really relevant to our customers. Um, because sometimes we do things, we believe it's highly useful. Reality is it's quite often not. So all good stories start at the beginning. Um, I'm not J.K. Rowling, but once upon a time. Um, back in 1994, e-commerce arrived. I was fortunate enough to set up Europe's first online shop uh, called the Wine Warehouse. And it was very, very simple. We lived in Jersey in the Channel Islands. We had got an internet connection that allowed us to connect to Canterbury University onto a system called edX. It allowed us effectively to pump um, internet transactions through uh, to allow e-commerce payments to be made. That led to meeting up with Barclays Bank and creating a thing called Barclays Square. And things moved on. We saw very, very quickly that e-commerce was never going to work unless we presented our customers with the ability to understand what the goods they were buying were worth. What I mean by that is that when we set up in 1995, we used a unit of currency called a pound, which we're desperately trying to hang on to. Um, and um, effectively, the pound was the currency that we understood in this country. However, in France, the country that we're trying very hard to escape from, they still had a thing called the franc. And so the French people arriving on what was then Barclay Square, which was our first bank-endorsed e-commerce shopping mall, hadn't got a clue what a pound was, but knew what a franc was. And so what we needed to do was present to them a way of understanding the value for money. And so we did that by building a multi-currency payments engine. That led to the creation of WorldPay, just seeing that the name described what we did, and more about that in a bit. Um, and in 1997, we launched WorldPay, and we ran the Diana Memorial Fund following the death of Princess Diana. And I think we processed about £80 million in transactions, and the interesting stat about all of that in 1997 is we had no chargebacks and we had no fraud. By 2001, we'd had to introduce the thing called the World Pay Guarantee. And the World Pay Guarantee was to protect consumers against chargeback and fraud. And the reason for mentioning that is the change in behavior market dynamics that occurred over a very, very short period of time, some four years, was very, very dramatic and happened within that time. When the internet arrived, it transformed all of our lives. It moved from an environment where we used to do this strange thing called shopping, and most of us transacted within a 30-mile radius of where we lived. Uh, and the reason why I know that is we did some work with WPP, with Martin Sorrell, uh, in relation to looking in 1995 at what this ha the, how these habits worked and how we consumed and bought things. And of course, the internet changed all of that. Uh, it moved us into a society of instantaneous gratification. You know, we get up in the morning, we look at our social media, we look at LinkedIn, we look at the news, you know, we shout at our uh, Siri device and say, please tell us what the weather's going to be. Everything has to be like this. You know, we used to wait, have to walk down to the shop, buy a newspaper. We used to have to go to a shop and find out what vegetables they have. All of that has changed. The whole way that as a society that we work now over the course of the last 24 years has been completely transformed. And that has had a massive impact on distribution. And distribution isn't just about how quickly Amazon may or may not deliver a parcel to your house. Or the fact that British Gas now has an amazing app. Have you heard this on the radio? Right? What you can do is you can download British Gas app when the plumber is coming to fix your boiler. And it will give you 15 minutes warning of when he's due to arrive to give you enough time to go to the shop but I, to buy some more milk to give him a cup of tea. This is absolutely true, right? And the irony of that, the irony of that is that when you look at the distribution of technology, the distribution of customer service, and you laugh at that, what that app is doing, and then you stand back and you look at the industry that we're involved, which is financial services, we're one of the only industries in the world that do not give any service levels at all to our customers. None. They get what we deliver, not what they expect. So 
if we just look at where we're going, you all know this stuff. I don't need to talk to you about it. But e-commerce is going bonkers. And the changes that I mentioned a second ago, in particular about distribution, how we procure things, how we buy things, how we use things, is only going to get better or worse, depending upon which side of the supply cycle you actually sit on. So the way that we buy things, the way we consume things, has changed completely. And it will never go back to the way it was before, despite the wants of various politicians to reverse the fact that it was village life in the UK used to be really nice. And what else has happened over the last few years? You know, I wish, wish I had bought the domain internetofthings.com, right? Because I didn't, right? But if we now look at what we're thinking of doing over the course of the next few years, this is e-commerce. Right, the slide before you talk about e-commerce, you think, oh, I'm going to go to the shop, I'm going to buy something, I'm going to get it delivered to my house, it's going to be convenient and easy, and if it doesn't fit, I don't give a damn because I'll send it back. Right? The reality is the way that we connect and we communicate and the way that we are going to start consuming things has changed forever. How many people in the room have got a wearable? Hands up. Point proven. If I'd asked the same question a year ago, what would the answer have been? So everything is changing incredibly rapidly in the way that we consume things. And every one of these different devices, whether we look at a smart city, whether we look at a smart home, or even look at connected cars, one of the projects we've got that's really interesting at the moment within Clearbank is how do we turn a car dashboard into an ATM? And why not? Right? Because I, as a driver of a car, would lo love to be driving my car get stuff, stuck in a traffic jam, be able to book a hotel using my onboard computing system and pay and get a discount for the hotel that I'm going to turn up and arrive at. Because as a consumer, I'd quite like that as a service. It makes sense. It fits into my lifestyle. And so over the course of the next few years, all of these trends in relation to our connectivity and communication are going to advance and they're going to be driven by innovation that, in theory, is created by the people sitting in this room tonight, those who have not consumed all the alcohol. So jumping on a bit, when I started the internet in the UK back in 1994, we only had a thing called a PC. In fact, I remember the name of our first PC. It was called Zippy. It was a 486 PC, and it was programmed to fail on a Friday night so that we could all go down to the pub. What's happened now is we're moving across into multi-platform use, multi-platform is the norm, mobile is transforming. How many people in this room have seen 5G in operation? And what was your view of it? What was your view? Awesome, isn't it? If you, you can download a movie in a couple of seconds onto your phone. It's just transformational. So where is 5G today? Not in the UK, not in many places in Europe. If you look out to China and various other, other emerging economies, that's where it's at. So multi-platform majorities will start to rule, and what we've got to do is develop applications, going back to the message about distribution, that deliver solutions to customers who are now consuming our products and services in a whole new way. So when we ball that back a bit, Right, and say, okay, these customers, these people that we want, the people that we want to be able to buy from us, consume our products and services, and pay our salaries, because that's quite an important point. Right? We need to know just three things about them. We need to know who they are, we need to know how they're paying, and we also need to know what are their expectations. Because if we don't deliver to their expectations, they won't pay, and they will not tell us who they are. So it's a bit of a circular problem. So how do we start sorting this out now, looking at tech today, not tech back 19 years ago, 20 years ago, when the internet was connected? So it's probably something like this. All right? It's all about cognitive services. It's about how we talk. It's how we apply machine learning, how we apply knowledge, how we understand language. You know, my son was sat in the back of our car a couple of weeks ago learning Bulgarian, because a chap that he was ski racing against was from Bulgaria. And on his smartphone, he has an app that allows him to do that. 
and he identifies himself to his smartphone with his face. So all of these things in relation to identity are available today and connected today. The trick that we're missing is the obstacle we're putting in the way to the marketplace is requiring all of our customers to sign up to multiple different versions of the same thing. So as opposed to trying to come up with a collaborative experience which actually makes our customers happier, we say, if you can't connect to the UK Inland Revenue Service, you have to say, my voice is my password. It doesn't say anything else. It just says, please repeat. You say, my voice is my password, and it authenticates you using voice biometrics. Yet you can log into your computer using facial recognition. Cognitive services is a massive game changer, right, which will move forward over the course of the next few years. And the winners in cognitive services are those who collaborate in relation to their customer experience to give their customers a single point of contact for multiple experiences from one cognitive service location. So let's talk about money. That really gets us all excited. It's what we're very, very interested in. And so let's look at how money is going to move around. Well, it's all electronic now. We don't need pound notes or euro notes or whatever. You know, we all love contactless. It's fantastic technology. It makes life easy. It means you can get Starbucks whenever you want, which suits me, personally fine. So electronic transactions, non-cash transactions, are going to continue to rise and continue to rise. The central banks around the world are responding to this. You know, one of the joys of life I have is that I go and talk to many of the world's central banks about the stuff that we're doing in the UK. And many of them are talking about some stuff called RTGS, which they've talked about for a while, which stands for Real-Time Growth Settlement. Now, unfortunately, real-time growth settlement, when they first initiated this, wasn't quite real-time. It was 9 to 5-ish, Monday to Friday. But that was okay, because the banks were open, so that was real-time. The reality is that real-time money is going to move to 24 by 7 by 365. Why? Because that's what the currency in your pocket does today. Yet the digital money that we have, the payments that we make, the payments we receive, do not have the same utility as physical cash. And technology has introduced friction points in to the movement of money. If you wanted to pay a supplier today in South Africa, ironically, it's quicker to run down to your local bank, take out a bag of rand, jump on a plane, fly to South Africa and hand the cash over than to try and send an international payment to that, 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 that business. And the other thing that will happen is that the, by doing that, you've achieved something called settlement finality, which is the same thing that happens when you hand cash over. You know, if I give somebody in this room a five-pound note, they say, thank you very much, Nick, that was a big surprise, and it would be, right? But the reality is I've cleared my debt. It's settled completely. When you have payment delays, you delay something called settlement finality. And the cost to the global economy of the failure to be efficient in our payment transactions is trillions of dollars a year in lost economic efficiency, which we as financial services organization deliver as a purported benefit to our customers. So the delivery of money, the delivery of, of non-cash transactions, electronic payments and all the rest of it, will have to change so that we get to a point of delivering solutions which meet the expectations of our customers. which brings us to where we are today in relation to customer expectations and the hype cycle and all the rest of it. And I think perhaps there's a few interesting experiences that we could share in relation to this. Um, we have innovators, we have the early adopters, we have the early majority, and you all know how this stuff works, all right? You know, is cryptocurrency currently in the chasm? And will it ever recover? Is a real-life example of a customer expectation, perhaps a very brave customer, who've looked at the way the changes will, hurt, will, will develop. Is the internet about to move from the early adopter to the early majority? Not because of the number of connected users that we have, but in relation to the services and efficiency that it can deliver to the marketplace and to our customers, to actually profoundly change the way that we all work and if that happens, who are going to be the pioneers that win? 
Will it be Facebook, Microsoft, Google? Or will it be small, innovative companies? Will it be organizations who take advantage of all the changes in regulation that are going on at the moment? Or will it will be companies who decide that they can't possibly win? Because when I was setting up the internet in 1995, I remember being told by a potential investor, you have no chance, Nick. Microsoft are going to do this first. Well, they didn't. And so there's numerous examples of customer expectation, opportunity delivery, and opportunity to change. So moving towards the end of all of this, uh, so you can get back to your dessert, is a few takeaways in relation to some of the stuff that I've learned over the last few years. The biggest thing I think I've ever learned is that distribution costs kill companies. Whatever idea that you've got, all right, it's very, very easy to have an idea, get excited about it. Getting that to market, getting happy customers is incredibly, incredibly difficult. It takes far longer than you expect. It costs far more than you think it's going to do. And all of your customers are already wrong, always wrong in their assumption of what you were trying to sell to them. All right? And research and market testing is difficult. Despite the fact you can spend millions of dollars on doing it, it's still difficult because it's not a precise science. Because what you do is you present what you want people to hear, not what you want them to actually respond back to you on. And so consequently, most startups change tack. You know, your initial customer engagement is unexpected, uh, and customers always prefer to red to green. And I know that from experience. When we started doing the internet and doing web design and all the rest of it, we used to say to them, look at this beautiful website. And they'd say, on Monday, that's fantastic. Well, on Tuesday, they said, can we change that color? And on Wednesday, they say, can we change that color back? So variance is something that you have to build into the opportunity that you go after. But more importantly, society has changed. Instantaneous gratification is now the norm. It absolutely is. I was with the chairman of one of the other UK banks a little while ago. I've mentioned his name to a few people. I, will, I don't know if this is under Chatham House rules, but I won't make, mention his name tonight. Um, but I said to him, you know, I see that you've had these new devices installed when you come into your bank. He said, what new devices? I said, well, you walk through this, the doors and you look up and there's a little box and there's a green light on it. He said, what, what little box with the green light on it? He said, it's got CSR written on it. He said, what the hell do they do? I said, it's this new technology just for banks. It's a common sense remover. It's for all of your employees when they walk through the door. All right? It takes the common sense away. It's great, great product. All right? so, so instantaneous gratification is the norm. And it's socially directed and demand driven. So all of the historic stuff, if any of you went to business school, as I was fortunate enough to do, everything that we're taught is changing, and changing so quickly, so, so quickly. So the final part of this, all right, in relation to the innovation bit, which is the bit I really enjoy, all right, is who will be your customers when you actually get to market? All right, and in the process of thinking about that, go out and very, very quickly take your competitors' tech apart and understand it, but do that really quickly because by the time you've done that, they'll have changed it. Because it's so quick to change. Plan to engage with your future customers quickly to get early adoption. And there are many things that are affect customer adoption. The biggest thing at ClearBank that affects our customer adoption is cybercrime. Nothing to do with banking at all. It's cybercrime and the capability that we built into our technology when we jumped onto Microsoft Azure to sit behind the Microsoft Shield, which gets seven trillion cyber attacks a day, and Microsoft invests a billion dollars a year plus in protecting my little bank in the UK for me. So sometimes the way that you engage with your customer is different to the way that you think the ordinary would be. And remember that market education is time consuming and cost costly, but most, most, most importantly, going back to the little giggle that we had about the common sense remover. Remember that Mrs. Smith is ordinarily the consumer who will buy the products and services or use and consume the products and services that you're delivering and building. And she's got to understand your message and she has to understand the service levels that are being delivered. And by 2025, 
the service levels that I have talked about in relation to financial services, I am highly confident we will eventually be delivering to our customers. The end. Thank you.